Hello, Bedford Community Church family. My name is Jess Camberary, and I'm so glad that you have joined me this week at BCC. There is so much going on and so many ways to get involved, to serve, and to grow. Let me tell you about some of the things I'm looking forward to this week. My good friend, Deanna Pastor, wanted me to let you know that there's still room for you in growth groups. And I'd like to encourage you to speak to Deanna or check our website if you have any other further questions. Hope to see y'all soon. And of course, you can join mine Thursday mornings right here at BCC, 10 a.m. Y'all sign up now, you hear? If you're looking for other ways to get involved, we have the Mount Kisco Interfaith Food Pantry and CPR classes. They're filling up soon, so you better sign up. Please check with Danny to get your next spot reserved. This coming Friday, our youth will be headed to Lake Champion for a weekend retreat. Please be praying for them and the adult leaders going with them. If you have ever been with the youth, you know what a privilege it is and they need our prayers. So please pray for them. Now this is something y'all gotta know I'm a little jealous about. I love bacon, I love it a lot. But these MOBs, men of Bedford, are having their next breakfast and it's just for men. Women aren't involved, but we're proud of y'all. So please sign up, it's April 13th at 8 a.m. Go get your bacon. Anyway, all this is happening and so much more. Please be sure to check the website, your emails, and the welcome board outside the sanctuary for all details. And as always, thank you BCC for being so generous. None of this would be possible without your generosity. Please continue to support us through the website, email, the app, or by scanning the QR code that is on the seat back right in front of you. However you give, just know it is truly appreciated. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts, family, and we hope y'all have a blessed and wonderful week. Bye now. Good morning, everybody. It's so glad to have you here this morning, whether you're online with us on your phone or your computer. Today's call to worship comes from Psalm 92. It says, It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. So whether you're able to join us here in person, whether we're online, it's so good to proclaim the name of the Lord together virtually in any way. So let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time and this opportunity. God, we thank you for the technology that lets us be able to connect over the air. God, we just pray that as we sing together, Lord, as we pray together, God, let your name be made known. Let your truth reign out. And God, let us be able to learn something about ourselves, to be able to leave here to go better and be better than uh, we were before. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, BCC. We are doing a two-week mini-series on forgiveness. I'll get to start things off, and Pastor Sarah will close it up next week. This is a great concentration to follow up on Holy Week, which culminated in Jesus' death on the cross to forgive us of our sins. However, before we open the text and dive into the power of forgiveness, I want to take the opportunity to say a little bit about myself. Though I've been coming for a few years, this might be many people's first time actually seeing me. So, allow me to introduce myself and give you a little bit more about my story. My name is Andrew Gobriel. I'm the director of Emerging Generations. In other words, I'm the youth guy. I grew up in Westchester County almost all my life. I also grew up in the church all my life. And though I grew up in an incredibly loving and supportive home and a church family, that was not my experience everywhere. In school, I dealt with being bullied, singled out, harassed, and even assaulted regularly. It really messed with my self-worth. This boulder-sized depression grew up and into my chest, and it felt like I was helpless, and I had to bottle up everything. However, like I said, growing up in the church, I heard a lot about a different kind of life that was offered by God, regardless of my outside experience. I was made to attend youth group and go on retreats and basically be at church eight days a week. Even though it might not have seemed to be working at the time, I am so thankful for being in that environment. 
It was not until the summer of 2001 where I had to go to this giant youth conference called Life. And that all seemed to be where it clicked. At those conferences, there always seems to be some kind of big buzzword for the theme. And that year, the theme was trust. They challenge us to give God a shot and see what might happen. Worst case scenario, I would live the same way. But maybe everything could change. I encountered Jesus in a real way, and that control of depression and that shame that plagued me for most of my life was healed, and I felt free for the first time. And then I devoted my life to God and his entire kingdom. Whatever he wanted from me, he had. I gave him my perpetual yes. Fast forward, and it was youth ministry that became my calling in life. I strove to build up the worth and value that God has defined for all of us in youth. I do not see it as a job. I do not see it as a 24-7 assignment. I see it as a lifetime calling. In the way that I would not be here today without a youth ministry program, I stand to pay it forward. So that's a little bit about myself and how I got here, and I thank you for letting me share that with you. So when we look at forgiveness in the Bible, it's chock full of options. In fact, the Bible has to say about forgiveness more than 120 times. Rather than reading every one of those verses to make a point, we're going to zero in on one specific passage. Forgiveness is more powerful than we know, and we're going to look at it as an example from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind his feet, weeping, she began to wet her, his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is and who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which one of them will love him more. Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. When we look at the notion of forgiveness, whether in our lives or in the studying of the lives of others, it's worth addressing that psychology has taken an interest in it as well. And here's what the research has to say. It concludes that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and wishing the other person would die. It looks at the results of what it does to the individual who does not forgive, and so the research will emphasize that you're giving yourself a gift when you forgive. You're freeing yourself from it. Though that is true, that is not the emphasis of the Bible. The emphasis of the Bible is that forgiveness is about giving the other person the gift. The focus is on the other person. One way to think of it is that God did not forgive you or me to feel good about himself or to release himself from some sort of prison. He did it out of love, just pure and awesome love. So we want to lean into those biblical reasons for forgiving somebody today. God says to trade our anger for love, and we are to love our enemies because he loves his enemies. God commands us, God's command to us is simple. Forgive others like I have forgiven you. Though simple in concept, it seems almost impossible to execute. Thankfully, God does more than just give us the command. He walks us through it. He instills it in us, that missing piece, his compassion. However, there's another trade-off that is kind of on us. We need to first trade our pride 
in order to receive the love and forgiveness, and then we can then forgive others who have hurt us. Because you really can't give what you have not yet received yourself. Wayne Trotman put it this way, one of the most devastating symptoms of pride is the unwillingness to forgive. So the Bible emphasizes that we must forgive for the sake of others, and here's how it plays out in the text. And it starts off with a pretty strange event, and then Jesus tells us a story, and then challenges us into some pretty hard stuff. It all starts with a Pharisee named Simon. Generally, Pharisees are the bad guys. They're usually the ultra-religious who tend to flaunt their spirituality as a form of status. They take advantage of that constantly. However, we get the impression that once in a while, a Pharisee is uh, intrigued by Jesus. They kind of like him. We get that from Simon as he invites Jesus to his house for dinner to learn more. So dinner is at Simon's. There's several guests, and the house is pretty full, and a woman walks in unannounced. And I need to really stress that what happens here is weird. They're all eating dinner, and she walks in, and they know who she is because she has a vial of perfume around her neck. Or at least they uh, know the type of person she is. In first century Israel, prostitutes would wear a vial of perfume around their neck as it was one of the tools of their trade. It's what they used to make themselves attract men. It's what they used to make themselves more desirable. And so this uninvited woman wearing a vial of perfume around her neck comes in, makes a beeline for Jesus, weeping and starts washing his feet with her tears and pouring the perfume on them. She lets down her hair, which in the Middle Eastern cultures is shameful and you can get divorced for it. And she dries his feet with them. So, Imagine this today. You're having dinner at a restaurant and you see this. You see a woman just come in, breaking all social distancing rules, and starts crying and washing somebody's feet in this manner. Or weirder, someone at the actual table you're sitting at, this is happening to. This would be weird. It would be weird now, and it was weird then. And I, and I know a lot of times we give the Bible a pass on seemingly weird traditions saying that, well, that was thousands of years ago in a culture thousands of miles away. Well, as a man from Egypt, I can say that, yes, even in the Middle East, this would be weird. It passes the weird litmus test. So as this unfolds, this is what the scripture says in verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Simon thinks this to himself, and Jesus understands what's going on. Simon is now sizing up Jesus to see sort of what kind of teacher he is. Jesus addresses Simon's thoughts with this short parable. In verse 41, it starts by saying, A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. To unpack this parable, it goes like this. Two men owe a debt. 50 denarii, which is about a month's wages, and 500 denarii, which is a year's wages. What's important to the story is that though there's a large difference in debt, neither of the men could pay this back. Very important to the story. We'll come back to that later. The loner forgives them both. Jesus asks, who would love more? Simon has the right answer, at least intellectually. He says that the one who is forgiven for more will love more. Whether Simon intended to be profound or not, we can still appreciate what he said, that there is a large correlation between forgiveness and love. It's at its core. One way to look at forgiveness is defining it this way. Forgiveness is a generous release of a genuine debt. So then Jesus calls Simon out by letting him and everyone at the dinner know that he is the 50 denarii man from the story, based off his bare minimum hospitality towards Jesus. The woman, on the other hand, she's got it. She takes it to a whole other level. And here's what she's actually doing with that perfume. As said before, the perfume is a symbol in her trade, a tool of her trade. It's how she's been living her life. It became a symbol of her identity, her power, her everything. And she's expressing her love to Jesus in the way of pouring it all out to him. She's giving her everything to him in response to the forgiveness that she's received. A detail that is very important to understand is that the woman very likely had an encounter with Jesus earlier that day, where she was forgiven, maybe on the streets. Why this is important is that 
It gets to explain the story and her behavior. Verse 47 says, Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. It says her great love is showing that she has been forgiven. And two, we don't want to think that she showed love for Jesus, and so she was forgiven. But instead, the reason she loves is because she was forgiven. It is in response to forgiveness that she loves. Okay, back to Simon. He hears Jesus, and he might be thinking, okay, I'm the one who owes 50 denarii. That means I'm not as bad as her. I'm not at her level. And once again, Simon just does not quite get it. Jesus told him that regardless of the amount that was owed, neither from the story was able to pay the debt. Both had something to be grateful for. It can be easy to compare ourselves to others. Some of you may lean the way that Simon does and feel that you're doing better than a lot of the people around you. I personally still tend to compare myself to people that are doing better than me. There's a backwards way of thinking in God's kingdom, and we need to acknowledge it. The greatest saints are not the ones who need less grace or forgiveness, but possibly the greatest saints are those who consume the most grace or forgiveness. Those people who understand that they've been forgiven live in a bigger way. And that can maybe make forgiving those in our lives a little bit more plausible with that kind of perspective. Again, we tend to think that the spiritual giants are the ones who sin less. But have you looked through the Bible recently? Those that we do read about in such high regard did some of the worst acts. And yet now, instead, we might look at them as the ones who take note of how much they were forgiven and how big their sins were. So where does this event and parable stand today for us? Jesus' lesson to Simon still applies for us today. The power of forgiveness should not be overlooked or underestimated. For the woman, understanding how much she had been forgiven of led her to give up her line of work. It freed her to see that she had worth and value, and that even gave her the courage to throw it all away. When we read stories, we often try to write ourselves into them. See uh, who we relate to the most. Maybe you most see yourself as the woman who has so much to be forgiven of. Maybe, whether you like it or not, you relate to Simon a little, that compares themselves to other people and concludes you don't have that much to be forgiven for. So that must mean you're doing pretty good. Also, we need to acknowledge that any one of us could be the people that are at the dinner witnessing this entire interaction, not really quite sure what to make of it all and who Jesus is and claims to be, but you're definitely trying to take notice. You might be like me, where you've uh, seen yourself in each of these named characters at some stage of your life, and yet the one that Jesus is most calling us to emphasize is himself. He wants us to transition from recognizing his grace and forgiveness in our own lives and start paying that forward. Because as powerful as it is for you and for me to be forgiven, that same gift is for others in our lives, and that's something that we can offer them. Jesus has come to seek and save the lost. Ephesians says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as God forgave you. That is not a suggestion or a resolution. That's a condition. It's a command. Here's one way that this played out in my life. When I was in college, I took a class on a separate campus, so I'd have to take the bus. I would take this bus twice a week to get to class. Because I would take the same bus at the same time with somewhat regularity, you get to recognize familiar faces. However, one of the regulars on the bus was this older Jewish man, and I could tell he was not really a fan of me. He would glare at me every time I would get on the bus. He would sneer as I would walk by. I'm also pretty sure he hissed at me a couple times. This made for a frequent awkward situation, and I didn't really know what to do with it. For context, uh, you'll have to picture me with a little bit longer hair when I had more, uh, and a much longer beard. But to get back to what happened was that this happened for weeks. I was really getting beside myself on what to do. I started to get self-conscious and uh, fairly offended by this man. He had no idea who I was, and yet I could tell he thought less of me. About halfway through the semester, I was getting too old. I weighed my options to either push through those last few weeks and then be done with the bus and this hissing man forever. 
I even thought about walking the three miles each time. Yet, in college, I was also uh, taking time to lean into my relationship with God and figure out what would be best. It would be to ask God his opinion. In my praying, God told me this, ask him for forgiveness. I was like, what? I'm the one to ask for forgiveness? I didn't do anything. He's the one who's judging me and harassing me and hissing at me, but... After a couple more weeks with uh, those words gnawing at me, I decided to concede my pride. The most devastating symptom of pride is the unwillingness to forgive. I prayed for courage, and the next time I got on the bus, sure enough, there was the man, sneer and all. I sat next to him. He recoiled. I then went to apologize. I asked for forgiveness. I asked for forgiveness on behalf of the clash in cultures that we had, what my nation has done to his people and was still doing to his people. I even apologized for the whole slavery of the Jews in Egypt. I ended up saying that as I believe that Jesus has forgiven me of my sins, I ask that you forgive me as well. I felt awkward, uncomfortable, and a little sick with worry of what might happen next. The man then began to sob. He cried and he embraced me. He said he'd been holding on to this hate for so long, he never in a million years would have expected that Someone like me would ever extend an offering of peace. After that bus ride, things got a lot better. Jared now would save me a seat where there was glaring, now smiles. Where there was sneering, now joy. And where there was hissing, now laughter. The bus got better. You see, I had to put my pride down to forgive a minor offense in order for God to do something bigger. We're going to have a chance to respond to Jesus' command to forgive others like he has forgiven us. This is a time to think about forgiveness between you and God. Do you know how much you are forgiven? Also, this is a time to think about pride. How that might be preventing you from forgiving someone else so they might have freedom. You know, my willingness to lay down my pride and forgive Jared didn't just end with a major movement in his life. On that day, after I got off the bus stop, I had a student who was on the bus stop me. He saw this whole thing and was both confused and shook. He said he'd never seen something that was so compelling and that he wanted the same thing for himself and his dad. I said that it can happen with the compassion of Jesus. We prayed together. Forgiveness for the sake of others is not only transformative for the person forgiven, but transformative for those around us. As we go today, as we go this week, or as we just go, let these three simple words become our new lens. May become the first thing that comes to our mind at an offense, at an opportunity to share grace. So will I. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. God, I pray for the words that we read this morning. God, the power of forgiveness, it transforms lives around us. God, remind us of what we've been forgiven of, Lord. Help us to receive that. Help us to receive your compassion, God, so that not only can we put ourselves aside, but we can see those that are in our lives that we are holding hostage that we need to forgive, that we need to set free. So God, give us your compassion. Give us your love. Help us to want to lay down our pride. Bless us as we go. Help us to remember that as you did all these things, so will we. Amen. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. No point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light. And as you speak, hundred billion galaxies are born In the vapor of your breath the planets form If the stars
stars were made to worship so I I could see your heart in everything you made Every burning star a signal fire of grace If creation sings your praises so I God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. But once you have spoken, all nature and signs follow the sound of your voice. Home oh, as you speak. One billion creatures catch your breath Evolving in pursuit of what you said If it all reveals your nature so alive I can see your heart in everything you say Every painted sky, a canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you, so will I. So will I. So. Bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. Some of praise is still for shy. Then we'll sing again a hundred billion times. Oh, God of salvation. Chase down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion. Failures disappear. You lost your life so I could find it here. If you left the grave behind you, so will I. I could see your heart in everything you've done, every part designed and a work of art called. If you gladly chose surrender, so will I. I could see your heart a billion different ways. Every precious one, a child you died to save. If you gave your life to love him, so will I. Like you would again. A hundred billion times But 
would measure could amount to your desire. You the world who never leaves. 